So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how to prepare for this test. Hopefully you've already looked at the review homework and done that with the homework help. And then um, I put up a couple of review sheets, one with vocabulary and one ranking the questions from easy to medium to hard. So please take a look at those. And what I want to do is just talk a little bit about um, really an overview and then a few specific things to think about. So this test is only for um, chapters 8 and 9. So 8.1, we had what's called a sampling distribution. of the mean and it gave us two formulas so the first was this one which is the mean of the sampling distribution of the mean which just gave us mu and this is in your formula sheet but I want you to pay attention to what these symbols are this means the mean of the population when it's combined with the mean of the sample that's when we get into this issue of a sampling distribution. Remember that a single sample is just a sample. You know, you look to see how many Skittles there are <clears throat> in a sample of 10 bags of Skittles. But a sampling distribution is you take lots and lots and lots of samples and then you average your all the, the you average the means of all the samples. So it's like you're taking um, an average of all of your data collections instead of just a single sample. And I know that can be a little bit confusing, um, <clears throat> but no one's asking you to explain it. They're just asking you to be able to compute these formulas. So I have the mean for the sampling distribution of a mean, and I have the standard deviation for the sampling distribution of the mean, which is the standard deviation of the original population divided by n. And typically in these questions, they would have you first prove that it was normal, and then second, compute the mean and standard deviation for those sampling distributions within the category of a mean. And then they would ask you questions about probability, and you would use your StatCrunch um, calculator normal and you would have to input the mean and standard deviation that you computed in order to answer the question that they're asking about the probability of something. Keep in mind, every time they give you a new sample size, you have to recompute the standard deviation. The mean stays the same. It's not dependent on the sample size, right? But every time they would give you a new sample size, you'd have to recalculate your standard deviation put it into the normal calculator before you could answer the question about the probability of something. Okay, so what happened in 8.2? It was basically the same thing, but instead of it dealing with a mean, it was a sampling distribution of a proportion. Now, what is a proportion? A proportion is when you have a certain number out of a whole, right? And they call this P hat, okay? So how do you know you're dealing with a proportion? Well, first of all, if they use the P hat symbol, this means they want you to find the mean of the sampling proportion. So the formula for that was just the proportion of the original um, population that they gave you. So they could give it to you as a percentage, they could give to you as a decimal, they could just say, you know, 10 out of 15 people, so you would have to figure out what your proportion was. Okay, so if you see the wording like, you know, certain amount out a certain amount, then you know you're in a proportion. You also know you're in a proportion if they're using P's and P hats. Um, and it's important to identify that so that you know what formulas to use and what to do with it. So I can find the mean of a sampling distribution of a proportion. I can find the standard deviation of a sampling distribution of a proportion, which is P times one minus P over N all over, all under the square root. And again, if they change the sample size on you, which they really didn't do as much in 8.2, but if they did, then you would need to recompute your standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the proportion. Um, 
and then re-enter that into the same thing. Stat, calculator, normal. You put in your mean and standard deviation, and then you answer the question about what they're asking. Um, something to keep in mind, when you're using your calculator you, for proportions, then you would always enter proportions in the lower left box, the lower left box. So on your calculator down here, so you have your mean, standard deviation, this part, and this part. So here, that has to go in as a proportion. Um, in other words, if they just tell you, you know, what's the probability that X is greater than or equal to 250? Well, you can't just put 250 in. You'd have to put 250 out of what? Go back to this. Out of how many? Out of 1,000? Then you're going to put 0.250 in here. Okay? I know that can be a little confusing, but go back over your homework questions from 8.2 and you'll notice that every time you entered a number in here, it, this number had to be between zero and one. It had to be in the form of a proportion because we were dealing with proportions. So what does it mean to do a sampling distribution of proportions? Instead of just taking one sample, you know, and you go, oh, well, there were, you know, four out of 10 Skittles were purple in the one sample that I took. Instead, you would take lots and lots and lots of samples and then find the average of those proportions. So that was a little bit weird. But anyways, for the most part, these two sections were generally the same. You found the mean, you found the standard deviation, you put them into your calculator, you answered a question about probability. Somewhere in there, they made you show them that those were normal. Okay. All right. Then we went to chapter nine. In chapter nine, we had nine, one, nine, two, nine, three, right? And I believe nine, one um, was proportions. I could have these out of order, but it doesn't really matter. And that these were means, and that these were either variances or standard deviations. Okay, what were they asking you to do in these problems? They were asking you mostly to construct confidence intervals. Okay, so for the most part, it was the same format. You just had to go to a different place. So if it was a proportion, then you would do stat, proportion stats. And then typically, it well, it was always one sample and then, I don't know if you can see that. And then usually it was with summary and sometimes it was with data. Now, how would you know if it was with data? It's with data if you can open up the spreadsheet and it just has all these numbers, you know, filled out, whatever. You have just all your data in the cells, then that's with data. And that's easier to do because then it just does everything for you. You don't have to fill everything in. But most of the problems, it wasn't with data, it was with summary. So they would summarize what had to go into the boxes that opened up in the screen when you pulled this up, okay? Once you have this open, you know, most of you did very well, right? You put in your, now how do I know it's a proportion? You put in your X out of your N, you know? four out of 10 Skittles or whatever, right? It was, it was always in terms of a proportion. So look for clues that would tell you it was a proportion so that you know to go to proportion stats. If you have a proportion and you go to T stats instead, you're not gonna have the information to fill in the boxes, okay? So if you find that that happens on the test, then you're probably in the wrong stats, okay? So means would have been what, stat, T stats, T stats was for means. And then same down there. For variance, it would have been stat, variance stats. Well, I don't know if it uses the word stats, but anyway, variance, well, I think it does. If they wanted a standard deviation, if they wanted you to, to construct the confidence interval about a standard deviation, we don't have a stat standard deviation stat.
you have to use variance stats, and then you take the square root of your answers. Okay, so you would use stat variance stats for the confidence interval. You get your lower bound, your upper bound. You would take each of their square roots to put your answer in for a confidence interval around a standard deviation. Okay, so what's similar? They were pretty much, you know, obviously they want you to show that they're normal and each had kind of different stipulations. So look at your notes for that. And then they wanted you to construct a confidence interval. Okay, if it's a confidence interval for a proportion, it's stat proportion stats. For a mean, it's stat t stats. For a variance, it's stat variance stats. For a standard deviation, it's stat variance stats and then take the square root of your answers. Now, what else did they do? Sometimes they would do it backwards. They would want you to determine the sample size and they would give you the confidence interval and the width and blah, blah, blah. You would still do this, but instead of going to um, with summary, you would go down to the bottom, which said something like width slash sample size or something like that. It was the bottom selection. Same with this. This one, I don't think they ever asked you for sample size. So they could ask you two different things, construct a confidence interval or find the sample size. In both cases, you enter through the appropriate stats, either proportion stats or T stats. And like I said, I don't think they ask you a question here about sample size. If it's confidence intervals, you would do the one sample and then either with summary or with data. If it's the sample size, you would go all the way to the bottom of it and choose the width one, okay? Um, all right, so what's the last thing I want to talk about is just this issue of, you know, if something happens, then what does this mean for this? So um, if my sample size increases, so it goes up, so I have more, so this is my N, then what can I say about my error? or my width. So the width, we're talking about an interval. So if I have a width of, you know, from 10 to 20, okay, then the middle number is 15, my error would be five. So the error is just the distance from the middle to either side. So if I increase my sample size, what happens? All right, you know how when you go to buy something off Amazon, and you look at the reviews and it's like, oh, this thing got five stars. But then you go, well, how many people reviewed it? If only two people reviewed it, that's a small sample size. So there's probably a lot of error in there, right? You can't really depend on that. If my sample size increases, if all of a sudden there were 2,000 people that gave it five stars, then you go, ooh, that's a smaller error, right? That's more precise. So my error would decrease as my sample size increases, right? It gets more precise. So what happens to the width? Then it gets closer to the real number. If my real point estimate is 15, then instead of going from 10 to 20, so I've got this big range of people all over the map, it might go from 14 to 16, right? So we can call this, our error is just one now, one to the left, one to the right, plus or minus one. This is plus or minus five. So if my error goes down, then my width goes down, right? Because the width is referring to how far away your lower and upper bounds are from the point estimate, which is in the middle. So if I have more people evaluating that item, then I have less error, a smaller plus or minus range around my width, around my point estimate, okay? All right, how about if my confidence interval I mean, my confidence level goes up. Well, if my confidence level goes up, I'm gonna be more, okay, so let's, don't worry about this example for a second. Let's go back to the example where I was trying to guess a woman's age, right? And she's actually 55. Um, so that's my point estimate. So am I gonna, but I don't know that, right? So am I more confident that I'll capture her age 
if I go from, let's say, 40 to 60 versus um, 54 to 56. In other words, if I said, I don't know how old that woman is, but I, I think she's somewhere between 54 and 56. Well, I'm not going to be as confident that I really know her age because I have this smaller range. But if I'm like, well, I think she's somewhere between 40 and 60. Well, okay, I can be pretty confident that she's in that range. It's easier to decide that someone is within the age of 40 to 60 versus pinpointing them between 54 and 56. So I have more confidence if my error, so here my error is larger, okay? And they use E for error. And my width is larger. I have more confidence that I can predict that she's within this age range than this one. So here I have a smaller error. Um, well, here, what I would say here is, is that I have less confidence. Okay, so I'm gonna remove that. So my confidence goes up if my error gets bigger and my width gets bigger. The bigger the target, the more confident I am that I can hit it, right? A little tiny target, I'm not very confident that I can hit that, okay? So like, let's say I wanted to drop my pen and hit that. Well, that's pretty easy, I'm confident. What if I want to hit this little one? Well, missed it, well, missed it. Well, I kind of got the edge there. I'm less confident when I have less room for error, right? When my width is small. I'm more confident when I have big room for error and my width is big. Okay, um, and then we can go back to how about sample size? Well, if my sample size gets big, or if I want to increase my confidence, that's another way of saying it, then I can also increase my sample size, right? I'm more confident in the product if 2,000 people reviewed it and gave it five stars than I am if only two people reviewed it and gave it five stars. So don't try to mix and match these, okay? Because there's, it's not necessarily tr transitive, which is a a property in mathematics, but try to think of it intuitively with just the two things that they're comparing. And with that, I will say goodbye and good luck.